I, I thought I'd start off just by explaining um, kind of what the Channel Coast Observatory is and, and how we got involved with, with the project. So um, CCO is, is part of the national network of regional coastal monitoring programmes of England. And this is a, a long running strategic monitoring network that aims to provide um, data of coastal change, which is standardised um, nationally um, and then freely available to, to anyone that, that might need it. Um, the overall aim of the network is to provide the evidence base that's needed for flood and coastal erosion risk management, um, for decision makers and investment at the coasts. Um, we've got a long history of um, coastal monitoring within the UK. Um, some of our, our partners can trace that back to the 1950s. Um, but it was in the late 90s when the um, shoreline management plans were being established that there was a real call for a better evidence base um, about coastal processes and coastal change um, in order to inform um, flood and coastal erosion risk management. And out of that, um, six regional monitoring programmes were born, um, which are very closely interlinked with the coastal group network as well. Um, and about a decade ago, um, they were formalised into a national network, which just ensures that um, the data that's provided is um, standard around the country. So we became um, involved in the Coastal Resilience Project, partly because our stakeholders and our end user groups overlap so closely. So those um, uh, risk management authorities and local authorities that we work with in order to underpin their risk assessment at the coastlines are the same ones that will be wanting to do these kind of resilience um, assessments as well. And it's also very clear to us um, uh, from looking at the changes in strategy and policy, that resilience is going to be, become much more important to our stakeholders and our end users. Um, and of course, we're also a, a spatial data collector um, and provider. So um, we could feed in a lot of the data that we were collecting into this uh, resilience project, um, but also provide that um, forum for the dissemination uh, of the materials as well and making sure that we reach the, the appropriate people. Um, and, and Robert's already shown you a link there um, for how to get hold of that. Um, next slide, please, Robert. So with getting involved in this project, um, I think there are two main threads really, which I've um, taken out of it. One is to do with the quantification of resilience. Um, and I think what, um, what this project has done has shown that actually uh, uh, what is sometimes quite a nebulous um, concept of resilience, it can be quantified, but there are certain things that you need to do. And you need to decide what the metrics are that are gonna be used to represent resilience um, and to do that quantification. And you also need to assess whether we're monitoring those at the moment um, and is that data available? Um, while working through the project, it became clear that the evidence base is really at the moment set up for, for risk assessment. And there are data gaps when it, term, it, it comes to some of the um, additional facets that need to be included in order to assess resilience. And there's a number of, of barriers that exist to kind of collecting all of this data together. In some cases, it might be the fact that that data actually doesn't exist at the moment. Um, a good example for this, of this is probably um, coastal defence assets. Um, so due to the, the very complex way in which these defence assets are owned and maintained, um, there is no national um, map of coastal assets or their condition. It's actually one of the aspirations of, of the, the monitoring programme to put that together over the next few years. But it's very important in, um, if, if you think back to, to Robert's slide, um, the defences and the um, residual life of these defences is very important when it comes to, to defining resilience. So in some cases, we just don't have the data at the moment. In other cases, um, it became clear that the data is not freely available. Um, and an example of that might be some of the insurance data. Um, and uh, some of that data is either um, behind a, a paywall 
or it's um, embargoed or commercially sensitive, so not available um, to the wider community as well. And there probably needs to be some work done um, once it's established which are the, the key metrics for these kind of assessments on making some of that data um, available for this kind of usage. The other barrier, I think, is um, to do with um, accessibility and usability of the data that does exist. Um, and again, I'll take an example from um, CCO. We, um, in terms of coastal erosion, so we have decades worth of data on beach volume change, which definitely captures erosional trends, but they're not in a, um, a continuous line around the country. So there's considerable amount of work that would need to be done to incorporate them and get them into the sort of format that's needed uh, for this type of, of analysis and work. Um, and that was something that, that couldn't be done within the timescale of this project, certainly. Um, but of course, um, you know, nationally, there are other projects like the, the National Coastal, Coastal Erosion Risk Map, which do aim to do that. There are still some uncertainties, particularly around things like complex cliffs. Um, but there are data sets out there um, um, that, that are trying to, to make these kind of the raw data into a more easily usable um, format. And then lastly, we have to think about the fact that there's probably some additional data um, that, that we might not be thinking of that, that is important, especially when you start um, thinking about a wider um, end user group and a wider stakeholder groups than we normally have. And there may be um, other metrics that are very important to key kind of stakeholder perspectives um, that we need to think about as well. So I think the key message is that it can be done, it can be quantified, but then there needs to be some effort and some thought put into um, making sure that the data needed to do it is available. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the other um, theme that I took out of working on this project is about looking at the broader perspective. Um, shoreline management planning was, was very much the remit of the, the coastal engineer who was looking at this risk assessment um, and, and the various options. Um, but really, I think resilience is showing that um, there needs to be proper kind of cross department and cross institution working in order for, for you know, um, well defined assessments uh, for resilience to be undertaken using methods such as these. And actually, the uh, workshops that were undertaken, I think, were very good examples of, of how that could work. You know, getting a wide range of, of different types of um, stakeholders and partners in a room to discuss some, some of these elements. And we do also um, in the UK have some great examples of partnership working. There's several coastal partnerships who are already doing this kind of cross department and cross institutional work. Um, and, and they can act as models um, um, for, for others in how to get this kind of um, joined up thinking uh, to work. I do think though that there needs to be some strategic oversight to this kind of approach. There certainly needs to be some investment um, in it in order to, you know, in order to uh, actually operationalize this kind of method and a commitment as well from all the parties that, that are involved. Um, and there does need to be a clear definition of what resilience is while it, understanding that that definition may well change depending on whether you're looking at a regional or a national scale. Um, one of the nice things about this method that, that we've presented today is that it's very flexible. Um, we can um, incorporate the different stakeholder perspectives and we can look at different options and see how they might um, affect uh, resilience. So it, it does offer some flexibility within it. Now there's a couple of um, other national programmes which I think um, we will feed quite nicely and kind of dovetail quite nicely into the work from this project as well. One of them is the Geospatial Commission, which of course is um, trying to unlock the potential of this kind of geospatial data that exists um, in the UK, um, which hopefully will go some way to, to addressing some of these data gaps that we've been talking about. And the other one, um, Robert already mentioned that the Shoreline Management Plan refresh that has been reviewing um, all of the, the SMPs in light of these changes in strategy and kind of direction um, and national policies to see how that might impact um, the, the management options um, within the different uh, policy units. Um, so I think this has got great potential. Um, from, from my point of view, 
you know, definitely I'm, I'm keen to know what other data um, we can provide and, and how we can feed into these kind of processes for our partners. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just leave it by uh, with the question of what is resilience. Um, I came into this project with a very kind of uh, vague and ill-defined concept of what resilience even was. And one of the take home messages that I've had is actually that you can come to a definition um, and that um, uh, it is possible to quantify this and therefore monitor how it changes and predict how it might change um, as we put different um, kind of interventions in place. So it's been it's been a fascinating uh, project to work on um, from that point of view, and we're, we're very happy to be hosting uh, the outputs of it. Um, thank you very much.